one, if you would do that for me, please. This is not the beginning of a new series. I will be starting a new series, and I've, I think I've, I, I really have determined what I'm going to do, but it's one of those deals where you hate to just take that plunge and say, absolutely, this is what I'm doing. But I'll keep that a surprise. And uh, I just had something that's been on my heart for some time, and and I uh, thought this is a good time to just interject a more of a topical message. And um, you can see by the title that it has something to do with preachers, the title being Where Have All the Preachers Gone? And I don't know why I left the question mark out of the end of that the sentence there, but um, I did. So that is a question, where have all the preachers gone? But I want to first of all read First Timothy chapter 3. Actually, let's start with chapter 1. I have a few verses I want to read from there. Because, you know, if you notice that, that in Scripture, I, I really can't think of any example where God is just pleading with men to, to become preachers. There, there's never an appeal. There's never a, oh, please consider the high calling of pastor. It, it just doesn't come out that way in the Scripture. But there are some passages of Scripture that that just seem to demonstrate that it's a desirable calling, if you will. Look at the attitude of the Apostle Paul as he writes to Timothy here in chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, verses 12 to 16. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, persecutor and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I think the Apostle Paul, acknowledging how opposed to Christ he was, how he was a, a persecutor, a blasphemer, an insolent man, and yet God showed him mercy. What an example to those he would then minister to of the long suffering, the patience of our Savior. But he says, I thank Jesus Christ. Of all people, Jesus Christ, Paul says, enabled me. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The Apostle Paul is grateful for the ministry that God gave him. Now, granted, the Apostle Paul wasn't exactly a pastor like, like we see at the office of a pastor today. He was an apostle, and I, I, would, I would argue that he was an evangelist. He was certainly a missionary, a church planter, and um, had a tremendous ministry. But this is what he dedicated his life to, and he thanked the Lord for it. The Lord had put him into this ministry and he, and he admonishes Timothy here in chapter 3, verse 1. And it's just, it's, it's though it's, it's assumed that there will be men who desire the position of bishop, which is the position of an elder or pastor. Those terms are interchangeable in the scripture. And it says there in verse 1, this is a faithful saying. It's not, it's not empty. <laughs> it's not just words. This is a faithful saying. It is true. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. In another of the pastoral epistles, the Apostle Paul is admonishing Titus in chapter 1 and verse 5. And he says, for, the, for this reason, this is the reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. You put these passages together and you realize that there is a God-given, I believe it's a God-given desire for the office of a bishop. And it's almost as though it's implied in, in, in that, that there in Crete, there are going to be men who have that desire. There are going to be men who just feel the urge of the Holy Spirit upon their life that they need to be, they need to be elders or bishops, pastors. And that, and that Titus is there to as a part of that equation, as a part of that process to, to recognize those people and then to establish them as an authority, as a, to, to establish them in, in the churches there in Crete. 
But other than that, it's not like there's passages that just really say, you, boy, you really ought to consider being a pastor. <laughs> there's just no appeal like that. But as we move along today, I'm going I'm to present some things to you. And by the end, I hope you'll realize and see maybe why that is. And maybe why it's just, it's just if we're thinking biblically, that it shouldn't be a problem. But, but there is a problem. A, 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 the church is, is, is facing a growing, frankly, crisis. Now, let me just say this before I move any further. I'm not here to put a guilt trip on anybody. I'm not, I'm not here to make an appeal. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not here to twist your arm. I, I will make an appeal, <laughs> but it's not an arm-twisting appeal. <laughs> it's just an appeal to think biblically and to think rightly about these things. And just, and just stick with me here, okay? Um, I, I don't, I, again, I'm, I, ho- I hope you get the spirit that I'm, that I'm after here. But according to Barna Research, now this, this research is about a year old. But according to his research, over half of pastors in America currently are older than 55 years of age. Only 15% are under 40. To state the problem another way, the median age for U.S. pastors in 1992 was 44. And that climbed to 57 in 2021. So surely by 2024, it's 58, 59, I don't know, right? It's so it's an aging population, we pastors. I happen to be 57 right now, so I'm right smack dab in um, the middle, I guess. So you don't have to be a math major to figure out that there's coming a day in which there's going to be an incredible shortage. In fact, there already is a shortage of pastors. And that's only going to increase. Unless something changes. So it's, it's a huge topic. A, 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 a tremendous number of implications here with this reality. It's a multifaceted problem. It can't, it can't possibly all be addressed in one sermon. <laughs> and I want you to understand this. I still believe in the promise of Jesus. That he's going to build his church. He is building his church. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. I'm not one who's wringing my hands over this problem. In fact, you know, I think there are some realities that the church is facing right now that may force her into making some decisions, the outcome of which may actually be for her good. I'm not presenting a doom and gloom message here. At the same time, there are some, there, 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 some of the problem the church is facing is a matter of flawed thinking. And, and as, as that is the case, we need to correct that thinking. We need to be biblical in our thoughts. And we have to address this. So I want to look here this morning at just what some of the reasons are for the fact that fewer young men are pursuing pastoral ministry. To be honest with you, I can't say that I really know. I mean, I I have some ideas. This is one of the things I don't like as much about topical preaching like this is, I mean, and even topical preaching really should be expository. I don't feel like this message this morning is all that expository. And I don't really like that. Because I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel like it's my duty to stand up here and share my opinions. It's my duty to share the Word of God, and I, and I hope I'm doing that. And we've already looked at some scripture, and I hope that you'll see the value of the office of a pastor and the need for it in our, in our world today. And I think that's biblical. So I'm not preaching an unbiblical message, but so much of what I have to say is, is my thoughts, it's my opinions. And that's, I think they're, I hope, hope they're worth at least considering. <laughs> but I don't pretend to have all of the answers here or, or to even recognize all of the problem. But I want to at least take a stab at it and see what maybe some of the issues are, some of the factors that contribute to the fact that fewer young men are pursuing pastoral ministry. And then I'd also like to then present some answers to those deterrents, if you will. What I think would be biblical thinking in response to that reality and then I just want, this is my appeal, just to walk away from here having a, making sure that we have a right thinking on this issue. Because, it is, because if we don't, the problem may persist. But if we do have the right thinking, I think it'll take care of itself. Okay. Now, here's the problem with that too, is that I can't change, I'm not saying my thinking is perfect, but I, but I think there are some, some, some 
think there is something that needs to change, and I don't think that this little assembly here is going to like change the world. But we're not responsible for that. We're responsible for us. We're responsible for what we do and what we think. And that's my, that's my goal here this morning. So let's pray, and then we'll start looking at these factors. Lord, we're thankful for the privilege of being here today and, and just so grateful for this church family, for what you're doing here. And Lord, we just, we just want to be what you want us to be. We, we want to be thinking like you want us to think. We want to be influencing our world the way you want us to influence our world. We want to be fulfilling all the functions of a local church that are given to us in the Scripture. Just, Lord, as, as with anything, it starts in our hearts, starts in our minds, starts in the way we think. It needs to be conformed to the Scriptures. And then what happens outwardly will take care of itself as we're thinking biblically. Lord, help us not to just be hearers of the word. Help us to embrace it and recognize it as truth. Help us to then be doers of the word as well. So, Lord, bless these feeble efforts. I'm just taking my attempt here to address this issue. And uh, while it's vastly incomplete, I pray that maybe it's just a starting point. To, to challenge our thinking. So I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's consider some factors that I believe have contributed to this problem. Again, admittedly, it's my perspective. You might have a dozen pastors stand before you today, all with a little bit different perspective. And I certainly, as I've acknowledged already, know that my perspective is limited. It does not paint a full picture. But I hope there's some validity and hopefully this will get us thinking and perhaps it will start further discussion. And I mean just long term as we continue to move forward in our ministry. So I'm going to list several things here. And these are not all, they're not listed in some order of, of, of importance. or they just I've wrote, written them down kind of as they've come to me. And, and perhaps the first one kind of is, in some respects, it, it's probably the first thing that comes to about any mind, I suppose, as they think about this. Because... How, I didn't look up all the statistics, but I think we all know that, that there is a tremendous number of churches that are closing their doors. Should I say weekly? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really sad to think about. It's not to say that there aren't some churches being planted in our day, but the, but the number that are closing vast is, is vastly greater than the number that are opening. And so by virtue of that fact alone, there's going to be less, in a sense, there's going to be less, it's the declining church. But even has, having said that, there are still a number of churches that are not dead yet that are without pastors and have a terrible time trying to find one. But the declining church is part of the issue here for more reasons than one, not just a matter of demand. I think there's still a high demand for pastors. But there's another reason why the declining church becomes an issue here. Let me just review a little bit here of the way it used to be. And when I say a little bit, I mean a really little bit. I can't give you a full church history here at all. But I'm just, I'm just trying to paint a little bit of a picture of the climate that used to be prevalent in the church. And I'm going to go back to, because I, I recently did some, just a little bit of brief studying on this, kind of what would be the... the um, Oh, the, 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 the revival meetings era, okay, or the, the, the tent meetings era. Um, this, was, this was actually kind of brought to my attention a little bit because the church we ministered in last week down in Centerville is a church that was started through tent meetings. They had tent meetings, and that, that is what produced a, a core group of people who could start that church. So it sprung out of tent meetings, out of revival meetings. And that wasn't uncommon. Now, now, the peak of that era was 1880 to 1920. If you've ever seen the movie Sheffy, you know that it, it falls within that, that time frame. And, 
And um, there was a lot of itinerant preachers at the time, and, and they would, would travel the countryside and have these tent meetings, and people would flock to these tent meetings. Sometimes they called them camp meetings. And the Lord's used this time. It was, it was a time that was, was exciting. It was a time in which there was a lot of people that did come to true faith in Christ. Many churches planted. Much demand for pastors. You know, I don't know that it was necessarily the case at that time. Again, I, I haven't done the extensive history here. But I do know that probably at that time, and certainly springing out of that time, there came such a demand for pastors, and vocational ministry was considered the highest calling you could possibly have. I mean, if you were a pastor, if you were called to vocational ministry, particularly a pastor, perhaps missionary, you, you, just, you just accepted God's highest call. Now we're going to address that problem because I think that is a problem, okay? Um, but God used this era. They did draw a lot of people. Many rural communities had an evangel evangelical church as a result of these types of things. But this era and the years that followed did have some severe inadequacies. A lot of unqualified pastors... This, it kind of constituted the evangelism. It was institutional evangelism. It's, it's, it's invite people to church. That's how they get saved. Invite people to a revival meeting. That's how they get saved. Now, there's necessarily, not necessarily anything wrong with doing that. And certainly, I said, as I said, God used it. But how do I characterize this? It tended toward a Sunday Christianity. It tended toward a gravitation to a list. In fact, many of these tent meetings, these, these, these camp meetings, these revival meetings were all about preaching against the vices of the day. Hellfire and brimstone preaching against gambling and drinking and dancing. And a lot of people were convicted and God used it. A lot of people were saved. But it became a very, became, it, it developed into a very list-oriented Christianity Frankly, the era was void of biblical disciple-making. But at any rate, there was certainly growth. It was an expansion of the church. But now, things are entirely different. The church instead is on the decline. Now, some of those revival meetings have not all gone away. They still have them, particularly in the South. <laughs> okay, and I'm sure God still uses them at some point. I'm not trying to be critical of that. But I'm just pointing out the difference. And yet, in some respects, it's not all that different. It just sort of changed forms. Churches are dying today, along with their rural communities. See, part of it is just an economic thing. It's just that there's a, there's a migration to the cities. And the rural areas are, 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 are becoming less populated. And that's not a good thing, to be honest with you. <laughs> there's a lot, a lot of problems that arise from that. But it's just reality, and I'm not sure how you change it. But because of these rural communities dying out and an aging population, a lot of the churches are just dying out, literally, because the people are dying and there's no new growth. So that's part of an issue, part of the issue here. But the inadequacies are still there so often, even today. Once I think there was kind of an isolation from unbelievers. You invited them to church because you needed to get them saved. But you didn't actually become their friends. In fact, I think springing out of this era was, was a, a teaching that, was Christ, that, that Christians should not become close to unbelievers. They should not become close friends with unbelievers. So there was really, again, no disciple making, no The light, it's not that there was no light. <laughs> but the audience was just whoever you could get to come to church on Sunday or come to your revival meetings. The light wasn't going out into the world and light, life touching life. Not so much. Now, it's kind of the same way, only a different form. We're still inviting people to church. 
It's still the seeker-sensitive mentality that is prevalent and prominent and popular. But instead of preaching against all the vices, <laughs> we've actually become more, more worldly. It's like we'll invite them in and we'll show them that we can, be, we can have fun just like they want. <laughs> we, can, we can play on the music they want to hear. We can dress like they want to dress. We can live like they want to live. Well, we'll be a little better. <laughs> but it's still an attractional model to still bring them to the institution. But where once there was at least a difference preached and there was light in that sense of the word, now the light is dimmed. It's, and, and we're not the salt of the earth we're supposed to be. Our message has been tarnished. So we've adopted an attractional model, but still are weak on disciple making. Now, praise God, there's a trend, I believe, really. I, I'm convinced there is a trend where it's not just us. There's a lot of churches all across America who are beginning to make a huge emphasis on disciple making and not necessarily even the kind we do, okay? There's, disciple making is kind of a buzzword. I think some of it's more valuable and, and perhaps more biblical than others, but I, I commend the efforts. But the point is, it's still... The church is on decline. And what churches there are tend to be very, there's such a tendency toward a megachurch movement, a seeker-sensitive movement. That's, that's really problem number two here. It's the progressive church. Because see, what does this do? Who wants to be a pastor in a declining market? Who wants to get into this whenever the church is on de in decline? And whenever the popular churches are the progressive churches? I mean, the, pro the progressive churches have, have raised the bar, so to speak. Not in a, and not in a good way, I'm afraid. But it's like, if, if you really, the, the attractive pastor is the one that pastors that progressive church. So this is really what I've, what I've just previously described here. There are fewer churches, but many that exist are, are in urban areas, and they're much larger. For the last 40 years, I'm going to guess, this is my perspective, the last 40 years or so, there's been a, a trend toward the seeker-sensitive mega church. It's the popular church. It's exciting. It's the kind that every young man wants to pastor. The problem is, the average person doesn't have the ability to be the kind of CEO <laughs> that these churches need. And the alternative small church, particularly if it's in rural areas where they're not likely going to ever become a megachurch. I mean, that's, that alternative is just not appealing. But there's not enough megachurches to go around. So, why pursue the ministry? I don't want to be, I can't be in a megachurch. And I don't want to be in a small rural church so why pursue the ministry? A third factor here is the rise of the secular calling. Now, I want to be very, very clear here. This third factor I've observed is really a good thing. It, it really is. This, is. this is a good change. <laughs> but as is so typical, the change has gone too far. As we mentioned, historically, the call to ministry was considered the highest calling for a believer. But a change began to occur, I'm going to say, maybe it was earlier than this, but I'm going to just say the 80s. The 1980s. And again, I'm, I'm probably oversimplifying this, but there were two books that were written right around that decade that corrected some errors of traditional thinking. One of those books, and it's a book I highly recommend, but the book is Decision Making in the Will of God by Gary Friesen. This book refuted the idea that God has an individual will for your life and you are responsible to find it. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't mean God doesn't have an individual will for your life. <laughs> I, it, it's not necessarily arguing that that's not the case. It's arguing... That if you just obey God and do his moral will, he in his sovereignty is more than capable of putting you where he wants you. <laughs> he did it for Jonah even when Jonah didn't want 
to do what God wanted him to do. <laughs> if God is big enough to put Jonah where he wants him, he's big enough to, uh, when he didn't want to do what God wanted, he's big enough to put you where he wants you when you do want to do what he wants you to do. Just obey him. And he can put you there. Stewing over finding that bullseye of what God's individual will for your life is, is, is just not a concept found in the scripture. It argued that impressions and questionable practices like putting out a fleece after the order of Gideon and traditional means of finding that bullseye are merely subjective and and certainly not authoritative. And in my opinion, that is all commendable. But Friesen's conclusion seemed to be that one decides to go into ministry In the same way, he determines to become a doctor or a mechanic. And I do think there is a unique biblical approach that guides one into vocational ministry. That's another message. Some of you have heard me preach it. I've I've preached a message on, on steps to vocational ministry, and I think we can find biblical guidance in that. But I think that's unique. I'm not going to suggest that there's not secular callings. I think there are. The rise of the secular, I think there are. But there, there's not a place in Scripture that says, he that desireth the office of attorney, oh, desires a good thing. It just, it doesn't do that. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it's okay, it's okay to desire. And I'm not going to say that God doesn't give you that desire. I'm just saying it's presented differently in the scripture. I think there's something about a desire for ministry that's a bit unique. Second book that was written is called Your Work Matters to God. I don't know that this how prevalent this book is. I've, I've read it. It's a good book. This book, it's by Doug Sherman and William Hendricks. This book addresses the error that vocational ministry is superior to secular career choices. It rightly concludes that one can glorify God and please God through any legitimate career choice that's, that serves the needs, legitimate needs of mankind. Just as much as the vocational minister can glorify God. And I'm absolutely convinced of that. See, this is part of the problem of that earlier church era I described, is that it became so pastor-centric. And you, the way you get people saved is to come and listen to the pastor. And, and the ministry revolved on the pastor. And he was the highest calling. He was God's man. And, and it was all elevated beyond biblically. And it left the pew-sitter as a pew-sitter. One whose only job was to try to invite neighbors to the next evangelistic meeting. We need to recognize that everyone, every believer is called to ministry on some level or another. And you can do it within your vocation. And your vocation itself is a ministry. Your work matters to God. It is, it is meeting a legitimate human need for this time. And I know people argue, well, yeah, but what's, only what's done for Christ will last. And, and we have to have eternity's values in view. And that's all true. But somehow they make this distinction that if you're not saving souls and instead you're changing tires, well, you know, you're just not doing a good kind of work. No, you know, God put mankind on this planet right now for a purpose and we have to live here and we have to sustain life here and we have to meet needs here and every single person who does has valid work that honors God. That is, a, a, is so vitally true. And it helps people recognize and be more intentional about what they do and and for God's glory. And we all should continue to minister and fulfill the Great Commission in whatever sphere of vocation God has given us. So it rightly concludes that one can glorify God in whatever vocation they're in, as much as a pastor can. But here again, this can take... This is what can happen. It can take the mind that already has a built-in propensity towards materialism and financial security and give him an excuse to ignore any 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 desire that the Holy Spirit might be implanting in their heart.
It can cause us to lose sight of the vital and important role of a pastor in a local church. Let me just move on. I'm going to run out of time here. There are financial concerns, and I already kind of alluded to those, right? We, we know we've got to live in this world, and it sure is nice to be able to live comfortably. And, I, and I'm all for financial freedom. I'm all for Dave Ramsey and people like that that can show you how to, to live comfortably and live according to a budget. and live the, That's all good stuff. It really is. It's also really, really hard to do on a pastor's income. <laughs> there are two sides to this coin. And, and one of them is that we're in a materialistic society. Very high standard of living, if you compare it to, to, to the globe. <laughs> Americans live high off the hog. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying we need to feel guilty for our affluence in this country. But it is easy to, for all of us to gravitate toward that which will be more financially lucrative. Therefore, we tend to shy away from vocational ministry. To add to that problem, we realize that being a man of the cloth simply doesn't have the prestige it once did. Now, the other side of the coin is that a Bible college and or seminary degree is extremely costly today. Did you know that in the past 30 years, the cost of living in America has doubled plus, a little more than that? In other words, your dollar will buy a little bit less than half of what it would 30 years ago. But did you also know that the cost of a Bible college and or seminary degree in that same 30 years has increased four to five times? Now, there are scholarships and grants that can, be, can help in, with those expenses, but nonetheless, the cost is prohibitive to many. Now, well, you know, I, I was recently invited to take part in a group of men who together, they call it a cohort, would pursue a doctor of ministry degree. And even though it was discounted significantly, that degree still would have cost me $11,000. That's just not realistic for me. Now, again, I know I'm playing into the traditional and common mindset of Americans and American Christians today that you have to go to Bible college and seminary and spend the big bucks in order to be qualified to be a pastor. I also don't think that's true. And I think that's one of the changes that we might be forced into just by mere inability to afford a formal education that could end up being a good thing as we put the education and training of pastors back in the hands of God's essential ministry, the local church. <laughs> At any rate, i got to keep moving along quickly here. I'm out of time. And I, I, I want to get through this today. Another, I think, factor is the rise of the blogosphere. Perhaps along with this, we could include online church, home church. Um, which more often than not is really no church. <laughs> but there's a sense in which preachers are a dime a dozen today. Not necessarily pastors, okay, but preachers. <laughs> preachers and teachers. And everybody knows that, that many people today spend more time listening to their favorite preachers on any and all platforms more than they listen to the one who preaches from their church platform. And that's hard to compete with. I mean, okay, if I'm going to, then I'm going to compete it. I'm going to, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to compete in the, in the, in the market where I can compete. And that's through a podcast or social media or whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to be the local church. Not unless I can be, not unless I can be a mega pastor. I mean, who would want to enter what seems to be a saturated market in this sense of the word?
I mean, they, it's, it's kind of ironic because people do. It's like, get on the bandwagon. I'm, I'm not against these, some of these media. I'm not, against, I'm not against podcasts. I'm not against, I'm not against you know, blogs and blogs and YouTube and all that. I, I'm not against that. The problem is everybody and their dog's doing it. We've all jumped on that bandwagon. So why be a pastor? Why go to some church where nobody can hear me? Why, why go to a church where there's 30 people out there in the pews? When I can hop online and almost accidentally get 100 views. Okay, so let me quickly now answer <laughs> some of these problems. Please bear with me. Man. I suppose I could spend next week giving you the answers. <laughs> but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to plow through this, okay? Bear with me. The roast won't burn, right? So here are some answers that may contribute to the return of young men to pastoral ministry. So let me, let me respond to each one of these that I've cited with truth that I believe can overcome the deterrence. First of all, I know there's a declining church. But I also believe that Christ's promise to build His church is still operative today. Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. The Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What age? The church age. This is Christ's business. This is what he's doing. Great commission, building his church. And he's doing it till the church age is over. I still believe that. You need to believe that. It's, it's, it's what God says. We must not be, well, I, let me skip some of this, but we, we, we've got to find this balance. It, you, it, it used to be that people were separated from the world, but also isolated from it. I mean, you didn't have Christian friends. You invite, invite the pagans to church so that hopefully they wouldn't be pagans anymore. <laughs> now, We've become worldly. We, but we're in the world and of it. We've got to find this balance where we are in the world. We are not isolated. We are rubbing shoulders with unbelievers. We are mixing with them, not, full, not doing what they do. We're, we're separated from their worldliness. We've got to find this balance. We've got to realize that Christ is still building His church and having that conviction Though many want to, to, to marginalize the church, push it off into obscurity, it is still the object of Christ's promise. And I think if we understand that, that will encourage young men to pursue pastoral ministry. Secondly, Success in ministry must be defined by God. This is an answer to the progressive church. See, yeah, it looks, it looks great. That mega church looks like God is really blessing. My tiny little church looks like God is not blessing. What is viewed as success by man is often not viewed as success by God at all. And what is viewed as success by man is often, what is not viewed by, as success by man is often what God views as success. I don't, I don't want to make a blanket statement here that pigeonholes everybody in the same place, and it's only God that knows these things, and He's the one who hands out the rewards. But I believe that many progressive churches today may, may well be receiving their reward right now. I can tell you this for sure. Faithfully plodding away in a place of obscurity will, by God's grace, without question, result in rewards at the Bema Seat. And the key there is faithfully. You see, there, there is no reward simply for being small and obscure. 
The reward comes from faithfulness. And many good men in large and prominent churches will be rewarded as well because they're faithful. But the key is being faithful if you're in that large church or if you're in that tiny church. Listen, our focus has got to be on faithfulness and on God's definition of success, not man's. Don't just look at the megachurch as your model. And if young men are thinking biblically, they will understand that they must perform, if you will, for God and no other. And if that's their heart, they may well be more likely to pursue pastoral ministry. Thirdly, the desire for the office of an elder is still a good desire. This is an answer to the rise of the secular calling. Again, nothing wrong with the secular calling. Nothing wrong with it at all. I'm so grateful for all of you faithful people who, who work hard and you contribute to this ministry in more ways than financial, but financially and in your life. That's tremendous. Well, let's make, ta- make sure we maintain a proper balance in our thinking. You are not extra special if you follow God's call to be vocational, into vocational ministry. A godly layperson can glorify God by faithful obedience in whatever calling they are in. But the desire for the office of an elder is still a good desire. The scripture says so. Don't let the culture define what is worthy of esteem and what is not. Let the Holy Spirit and it's the Holy Spirit through the, through the Word of God and through the authority structure He's put up. Let Him be instrumental in giving direction to you if you have any inclination toward vocational ministry in your heart. Don't let the noise of the world and its philosophies drown out His voice. Please bear with me here. I know I'm taking more time than I should. You know, Second Peter tells us it's the Holy Spirit that produced the Scripture. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Going back to Revelation, those first, well, the second and third chapter, the messages to the churches, what was written there? Over and over again, to the angel of the church of fill in the blank. Seven different churches. Write. Notice it says write. John is to write this. This is the written word of God. These things say he who holds the seven stars and so forth. And then you go to the, towards the end of that, this is to, to the church at Ephesus, and you go down to verse 7, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And, you, and that same wording is used in every case. The, the, the word, written word to these churches is to be heard. It's the Holy Spirit. So listen to the Holy Spirit. Don't let the church drown out His voice. And the voice I'm talking about is not some mystical impression, though I'm not saying you can't have impressions and, and, and wishes and desires. And certainly 1 Timothy 3 verse 1 says that the office of a bishop, that desire is a good, good desire. I think it's a God-given desire. So I'm not trying to throw out impressions. But I'm not just talking about some mystical... That's subjective. I'm talking about the voice of the Holy Spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. I'm talking about the voice of the Holy Spirit that informs you from the Word of God that there is a need for under-shepherds, for pastors in local churches. I'm talking about the voice of the Holy Spirit that informs you through the Word that He uses local church leadership to acknowledge desire, to recognize and develop character, to recognize and develop giftedness, and to place people in the ministry. Can I just tell you as well, God will take care of his faithful servants. You know, money is never supposed to be the motivation for pastoral ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3, not for filthy lucre. That's not why you do it. But neither should it be debilitating, the concern for money. For money. It shouldn't be debilitating. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 is for all believers, including pastors. Seek first the kingdom of God, His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. He'll take care of His servants. And as I already said, I think one of the benefits, as you look at the other side of the coin and the cost of training, listen, let's just take care of that by local churches doing their job. I'm going way over a lot of notes I have here. So I'm going to 
I'm gonna, we're, we're getting close to the done here. Listen, the local church is still God's essential institution. This is an answer to the rise of the blogosphere. Christ never promised to build the Bible college. God never promised to expand the number of one's likes, subscriptions or retweets <laughs> or views. God never promised to expand those things for you. God promised to build His church. You can observe it in Scripture. Evangelism happens most effectively in the context of planting and establishing lo local churches. Disciple-making is designed to happen in the context of local churches. It can't happen, biblically speaking, on any kind of sustained basis in any other organism than the local church. Acts 1.8 You shall receive power after the... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is God's expansion program. It's His church expansion program. 1 Thessalonians 1.8 For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. That local church, their reputation went far and wide. They were a disciple-making church. And I think churches that are passionate about training young pastors from within, which is part of disciple-making, and they are passionate about church planting, will also have young men within them that are become passionate about becoming pastors. If that's the culture, if that's the atmosphere, God can re-implant that passion in individuals as the church is fulfilling the Great Commission. So, there are many factors that have contributed to the dearth of young men entering pastoral ministry. A lot of influences, a lot of thinking, a lot of philosophy, a lot of misplaced values, a lot of different things. But there are biblical answers to counter those deterrents. My challenge is that we just do our part to address this problem beginning with biblical thinking. Let's discern the noise of the world, the philosophies that have infiltrated. Let's find the right balances here. I don't want anybody to feel like they are second rate because they're not a pastor. But I'll tell you what, we live in a climate today where it's a temptation for pastors to feel second rate because they're pastors. Don't let that happen. Because I'll guarantee you that, bottom line, that's why young men aren't getting into ministry. It's not an honored position anymore. It's not, it's not what gets you praise and prestige, unless you're a mega church pastor. It's not lucrative. And we just got to adjust our thinking. Let's be biblical. And uh, um, at any rate, I hope you'll take that all um, as I meant it to be taken <laughs> and just realize there is a problem and we need to correct it. But that's not a call for all of you to job, drop your jobs and become pastors. That's not the slightest. That's, that's not the point at all. So um, let's just pray for God's heart, shall we? Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for who you are, for your program, for what you're doing, for your local church, for um, what you want to do in your local church. Lord, you, 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 you've designed it such that these are families. This is like a family. And just as our earthly biological families need heads, local churches need heads, under shepherds. Christ is the ultimate head. But Lord, you need, you, you've, you've designed it to, to, to where under shepherds are necessary, and they're vitally important. And um, I pray that we would not lose sight of that, and that you would give desires to Various ones. You, you know who's right. And you, you give, give desires to people that they'll be responsive. Lord, perhaps if it's not any of our adults at this point, perhaps some of our, our younger people, maybe some of the, the boys that are growing up in our homes, will be given a passion to serve as pastors. Um, 
Lord, help us to be to steward those opportunities as a church, to have the right kind of advice and right kind of encouragement, and be thinking biblically about it all, not to exalt them above others, but certainly not to discourage or Lord, we ought to be excited for, for those that would have that passion and desire. So thank you for what you're doing, what you're going to do, and thank you that you are building your church. Grateful, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.